I've always, I think I'm a, a perfectionist. I think I've always been. And for anything to go out of my shop that I didn't uh, feel was right, uh, I just wouldn't let it happen. worker for 35 years, a man whose beautifully designed and executed furniture has rarely been matched for its classic form and finish. Sam is probably America's number one craftsman in wood. He lives in this splendid sprawling house behind me, which he designed and built step by step himself. I'm Barbara Lee Diamondstein for Handmade in America. And one more thing. Sam Aloof has never had a day's formal training as a woodworker in his entire life. When I started, I wanted to get out of the hubbub of, of what was happening. I just wanted to, I guess I followed a different drummer, I don't know. I, uh, it is true, uh, I've been told that I was selfish for not uh, designing uh, where more people could use my things, but uh, this is being fulfilled, really. and. I do work for a lot of young people. I work for people uh, of great wealth. I work for people of very little means, and uh, I find that they both enjoy what I do. How many pieces have you done in all? Well, I, I think uh, the last time we counted, uh, there were something like 3,000 pieces, and that included chairs, uh, uh, tables, cabinets. Uh, well all phases of furniture. I've done churches, I've done a lot of offices, but mostly household furniture. With my very rough arithmetic, that comes out to something like 100 pieces a year, yes, approximately. Uh -huh. Two a week made by hand over a 35-year mm -hmm. period on the mm -hmm. average. Mm -hmm. It's staggering. Well, How it, do you manage to sustain that level of work? I work at 8, I uh, start at 8, and then I work till about 5.36, come and have dinner. And But when I worked alone, I used to work um, uh, I'd get up at 7, get out the shop, I'd work for 1, 2, 3 o'clock in the morning and uh, six days a week. But now as I'm getting older, although I don't feel older, uh, my wife says I should slow down, but I find it very stimulating and very exciting. What's the most difficult piece for you to make? I, I think the chair is, but I've made so many of them that uh, really I... Uh, don't find it too difficult, but I think for most people a chair would be the most difficult. Why more than a desk or a uh, table? The joinery. There's an awful lot of uh, joinery in a chair, and uh, uh, then too a chair that doesn't sit well. Uh, you know, it can be beautifully constructed, uh, beautiful to look at, but if it doesn't sit well, then it isn't a good chair. So that you have to take this into consideration too. What's your favorite piece of furniture to design? Well, the piece that I'm working on at the time, really, uh, all of them are my favorites. I enjoy, well, I, whichever piece I'm making, uh, I find just a lot of enjoyment in it, no matter how many times I've made that particular piece. You just mentioned one of the best known and widely imitated innovations that you have designed, and that is the use of exposed joinery. Whatever made you do that? How did that come about? Well, uh, when I first started, uh, I thought, well, what a shame to cover something that is so beautiful. Uh, I, uh, I just didn't feel that uh, joinery should be covered. I thought that after all the hard work of making a beautiful joint and then to cover it over, it took something away. And I think that uh, when you see a beautiful joinery, for example, on this rocking chair, um, people wonder how I make it. And I explained, but not very long ago in Fine Woodworking, uh, did an article about me. and. They asked if I would uh, uh, show the joint, and uh, so anybody can make it now. And, but I've had people call me and wonder, well, uh, you know, the drawing is here, but I still can't figure out how to make it. But I, I feel, I've always felt that there are no secrets in woodwork, uh, that it perhaps has been done before, and that if 
uh, I can make it easier for someone else uh, to accomplish what I've done uh, in a shorter time will find. Well, what's your method of working? Do you go back and forth from piece to piece, say, chair in the morning, a table in the afternoon? Well, oh, goodness, I, I work on a lot of them. I, in the shop now, I, I must have uh, 10, 12 pieces, different types of things that I'm doing now. And uh, if I'm making chairs, I, I don't make anything in advance. Everything that I make is sold before I start. In building a rocker, I start with the seat first. I usually, if I'm going to make five rockers, I cut all my wood out at one time. I put the back legs on first, and uh, it's a rather um, simple joint that I use, but it looks difficult. Yeah, I work awful fast. I, I think that if I started in the morning from scratch, uh, of course, you have to consider the, uh, the drying time and all that, but um, I think that I could put a rocking chair completely together in two days. But that does not include the shaping, it does not include the sanding, it does not include the oiling. I would say, I, I figure about two weeks, three weeks for a rocking chair. I think I'll put these on without any glue first and try them out and see how they fit. Each rocker is different because, again, of the density of the wood, the, uh, the way they balance. But uh, when I get through, they all rock pretty much the same. But they all have their own characteristics, their own personalities, really. And no two rockers rock alike, even though they're all made the same. shop is a little different than some of the shops that I know of that uh, craftsmen have. Uh, everything that is made in my shop I design myself. Uh, I do all the cutout, I do all the joinery, uh, I do the uh, uh, rough uh, uh, sculpting. When I started, it wasn't, uh, I never thought once about recognition because I thought, what a wonderful way to be able to make a living working with your hands and making things uh, that uh, I would enjoy making and other people would enjoy having. A friend of mine asked me how I went about designing a chair, and I said, I don't know, I just, I just start designing them. Uh, and I do, I, I really can't tell you. On every rocker that I make, they, they all rock differently because the wood on the, in the seat may be much denser than the one before, uh, the back uh, may be a heavier piece of wood and all. But after I make the chair, I use the same rocker on all of them. I, I have a uh, form that I laminate the wood on and by moving the rocker back and forth and then just tapping it and if it rocks uh, perpetually I don't know if that's the word to use or not then it's fine and uh, uh, 
I don't have a formula. I know there are a lot of books on how to make chairs and how deep a chair should be and how wide and the cant of it. And, and people have asked me this question, and uh, I, I use myself for a model. I'm not, uh, you know, I'm uh, not that tall, but it seems that no matter how uh, tall a person is, or how short, or how fat, or how thin, that my chairs seem to fit anyone. And, uh, how do you explain that? I don't know. Uh, I've had several people ask me to explain it, and I just don't know. And uh, Did you ever study woodworking with anyone? No, no, I never. Uh, I'm self-taught. I um, worked uh, for an industrial designer that was Bauhaus school trained, doing uh, window displays, and there I learned how to work with tools. But uh, And then I worked with an artist, uh, Millard Sheets, as his assistant. Um, but even then I was working in wood. And it wasn't until I got married that uh, I think my wife got tired of hearing how I wanted to be a woodworker. She said, well, just do it. So you did. with her faith and hope and backing, I did. Mm -hmm. Has this lack of formal training been a limitation to you, or has it freed you to experiment? Oh, I, I don't think it's... Uh, I think it's been great. Uh, uh, when I first started, uh, somebody had seen my furniture and asked if I would... Uh, do a commission, a dining table and chairs and all. And on the strength of that, I quit my job. And uh, it was sort of scary, but I did. And uh, first of all, I made drawings. And I, because I'd been a graphic artist, I did very slick ones. And then I made little models that I still have. And then I did a prototype, just nailing the piece together. And then I got an OK on it, and I proceeded to make the chairs. And I remember the first one I made, I climbed up on the garage roof where I was working in a little one-car garage and dropped it to see if the thing would hold together. Well, it, it held together, except it broke a leg. And uh, But uh, I did that for a while, and I thought, well, that's an awful waste of time. And uh, then I started making the actual piece. For example, the rocker that I'm sitting on, uh, I knew I had a picture in my head of what I wanted to do, and I just started making it. I developed it from just for myself, really. I uh, didn't know a thing about uh, furniture. I didn't have any furniture books. I didn't know anyone that was working with furniture. Um, so it just evolved. It just evolved. How do you find the apprentices who work with you? Well, the two young men that I have working for me now, uh, the one is a university graduate that was a fry cook, I think, before he came. And uh, he's been with me for four years. And uh, then the young man, Mike, the, the younger man, um, was a student at, um, I think, Long Beach State. And uh, I don't think a day, a week passes, I should say, that I don't have a letter from someone that wants to apprentice with me. And I feel very strong about training young people uh, to work, well, in my media, in, more, in, in wood. So I, uh, that's the way it happens. Looks good in here. Be sure you keep a hard line in here, though, okay? Yeah. A real hard line. Mm -hmm. Then the same way here where this goes, I want this hard line to follow through real nice. It looks pretty nice. You did a good job chasing that, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What's your favorite wood to work in? Walnut. Why yeah. that wood more than well, any I, other? Uh, it's a very warm wood. That, uh, uh, I think I myself uh, could live with walnut. Uh, where some of the other words, uh, woods, uh, I couldn't. Uh, it works beautifully. It uh, has a good feeling to the hand. It it's a sensuous wood. I don't know if that's the correct word word or not, but um, it's a mellow wood. It's a livable wood. The only thing that bothers you, you know, with this uh, horrible inflation and everything, uh, wood has skyrocketed. Rosewood, I, you can't even buy Brazilian rosewood anymore. And I have six orders for rosewood rockers, and I happen to have enough to make them. And uh, the price that I'm getting for them wouldn't even buy the wood today. Can you tell us what the chair cost, say, 10 years ago, and what it fetched well, several days ago? I think 10 years ago I was making these for, oh, $500, $650. And uh, that one brought $8,000. It surprised me. That's an awful lot of money. I. Uh, my problem has always been in pricing, really, and it hasn't been until recently that I, I've gotten a little nervy. But 
in some ways, I, I think it's um, sort of obscene to charge such horrible high prices. Um, it means that young people who would want to buy a piece of artwork uh, are just not able to afford it. And uh, but I, a lot of times, in fact, I've done it. Uh, I'm doing it right now for young people. They pay me so much a month. I, I feel that if a person wants one of my pieces that bad, then uh, so what? I, I don't have to have that much money for them. This house is really quite remarkable. Not only have you designed the buildings and the furniture, you've created very beautiful doors and latches. Is there any overall design or plan? Can you describe what you've done with the doors and the latches? Well, I. I don't like hardware. I don't use it on, on my furniture. If you uh, notice, on my furniture, you don't see any hinges. You don't you don't see any metal at all. And uh, because there is none. The, because there is none. I think the only hardware I use is in my piano or my wooden hinges, where I have a brass rod going through, but then they're tapped with ebony or, ro or rosewood. But uh, I find it just an awful lot of fun, a diversion, making the latches and the locks for the different doors. Well, in addition to being able to look at a piece and very quickly say that must be a Sam Maloof, I wondered if you signed your pieces as well. Oh, yes. I, I've always signed them. I, when I first started, I uh, had little metal num letters that I hammered in, and then I, I had a stamp, and now I just sign them with a burner. And uh, I start at the first of the year, for example, no matter what it is, uh, the first piece would be number one, 1981, number two, 1981, and then uh, now 82 coming up, the first piece again would be number one, 82. Do you stain the wood? Is it oiled? What is it? And is there a formula that you've created to create this well, wonderful it, finish? Uh, first of all, I, I don't use stains at all on any of my furniture at all. I think the natural wood is so beautiful. And then the sap wood, you know, it's the light colored wood. Um, I remember when I first started working, uh, I thought, well, how beautiful, the contrast and all. And besides, wood was expensive, and I didn't want to throw it out, so I just left it. But uh, the finishes that I use, I've used uh, many different kinds of finishes, but for the last, oh, 20 years, I've used a... Um, uh, first, it was a mixture of uh, linseed oil and beeswax. And um, then, on my tabletops, I use a... Um, uh, a third varnish, a third uh, tongue oil, and a third uh, well, linseed oil. And then to finish up, I use half tongue oil, half linseed oil, and then I throw in uh, a big two handfuls of uh, grated uh, beeswax in a double boiler. And people ask me the exact formula. And, that's the exact formula? That's the exact formula. I, I happen to have very big hands, I think. and. Uh, uh, so if a person has small hands, has to put in two handfuls. How is the happy owner able to maintain that finish once you come back to Alta Loma? Oh, well, really, it's quite simple. Chairs, by sitting and feeling and touching, uh, uh, takes care, uh, t chairs take care of themselves. On tables, on the tabletops, uh, the ones that we have here in the house, I don't think I've gone over them more than once a year. But if they do need um, rubbing down, uh, I always recommend that they take a sponge with just a little bit of uh, soapy water and wash the tables all off because over the years... Uh, soapy water on the wood? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't cause it to warp or no, discolor? No, no, no. Uh, what you do is take a sponge uh, with just a little bit of water and a little bit of soap and it's amazing how much dirt will come off of, uh, of wood uh, just with all the grime in the air and then a clean cloth uh, that is dampened and then you take and put the oil on and you use four-out steel wool, and if, there's, if it feathers, that just puts it right down again. Well, I've heard it said that nothing's ever left your shop that you're not proud of. That's a very enviable record of achievement. To what do you attribute that really high level of quality consistently over such a long period of time? I, I think there's a sense of pride in what a person does, or should have, a person should have a sense of pride in what he does or she does. And if you don't have this feeling about what you make, then you should go into something else. Sam Alouf is the real thing, a master craftsman in every sense of the word. His work is determined less by style or fashion 
and by enduring ideas of beauty and substance. With his skilled hands and thoughtful vision, he's also managed to create a way of life that is equal to the honesty and practicality of his work in wood. I am Barbara Lee Diamondstein for Handmade in America. Thank mm -hmm. you.